reads this. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and he will, uh, the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the straw. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors written hundreds and hundreds of years before our Lord Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Just to make sure. It's all. Like the question again is, was it too much? Have you ever seen Pirates of the Caribbean? The first one, was it the Black Pearl? Very, very good show. Um, it's, uh, the pirates have, refresh my memory, they stole a bunch of gold. Aztec treasure, yeah. Huh? Aztec treasure. They, they stole the Aztec treasure, and uh, they were cursed because of this, am I right? That's um, Throughout the entire movie, you are literally led to believe uh, that for them to, to, to break the curse, they have to do two things, correct? The first thing that they have to do is return the gold. Now, the problem with that was they... They stole the gold and then they spent it. So they had to retrieve the gold. And some of the gold was lost, uh, spent, or whatever. So they spent years chasing after the gold. And then the second thing is once they had all the gold, the last person, the last thief, if you will, had to shed his blood on the gold to pay for it. No, it was actually in the bloodline. It was it was somebody in the family because the person who had, had stolen the gold was at the bottom of the sea, I think. And and you're literally you're you're led to believe that the person who has to shed their blood had to die. And then when they got to the scene where they put the last Aztec coin into the chest. All they did was take a little knife and slash the hand 
of the bloodline, the thief. Couldn't God have preordained it in such a way to where his son, the son of God, could have come down and simply taken a blade And with that said, it is finished. Couldn't God have ordained it in such a way that just a few drops of blood from his hand be enough to erase the sins of such an insignificant creature. If you said no, God could not have done this, I don't think you understand the sovereignty of God. If you say that there is no way that God himself could have created a universe or a system in, in which one drop of the infinite God's blood could cover the sins of humanity, I don't think you understand the power of God. God is sovereign. He is all-powerful. Unless it contradicts his nature, he can do anything that he wants to do. Please don't worry. You know, he could have destroyed humanity after we sinned. He could have just wiped them off. I think that he could also have created a world, and yes, where one drop of blood was sufficient to save us all. But he chose, he chose before the creation of the world to go through that system. He chose that. Never missed that. Nobody killed Jesus Christ. He said, nobody takes my life. I give it freely. This wasn't a surprise. This whole system was preordained before the very creation of the world. That death that we, well, we, we just witnessed a glimpse of it, and of course it's just an artist's conception of what that was like. We do know that he went through a very horrific period of time because he chose to do it. And that is what he chose to pay for our sins. My question is, why so much? Why not simply let you pay for your sins? The Bible tells us that every single one of us has fallen short of the glory of God, and every single one of us needs to pay for our sins. The creator of the universe owes us nothing. It is your blood that is demanded. It is your death that he demands. Why? Why so much? A couple reasons, I think. In your bulletin, you'll find three things that come to my mind um, as I just start to <coughs> reflect on what Christ did for us. I think that God chose the horrendous crucifixion of His Son as His method of redemption. One is that He has a huge disdain for sin. And I think on some levels we can, I guess, relate with God. I would imagine that there are sins out there that you find disgusting. I personally am disgusted about the mere thought of rape. I don't know why it's that. That one sin right there is more disgusting than anything else. We talked about uh, counseling sessions in, in the, uh, in the, before I, I got up here. And one of the things that, that I have 
um, had to experience over and over again, and, and it's, it, it's nothing in contrast to what they were going through, is talking to young women or older women years after this is happening and watching them still just going through the pain involved in this. I was asked one time if I believed that it would be okay to allow an abortion in the case of rape. My answer is, I'll be clear. If you can show me, prove to me, without a reasonable doubt, that a man indeed raped a woman, then I support aborting him immediately. And I might add slowly. I wouldn't talk about the child. I don't think that there's any crime on the face of the earth that we deserve, that we need to kill the child of the father because of the crime of the father. So there are some, sin, some sins that indeed disgust me, and I can relate to God in this sense. But I have to admit that there are many other sins out there that I do not find as disgusting. Revenge, for example. I say that I wouldn't mind seeing a rapist suffer. without any reservations. And I have to say that that is sad. The Bible says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hair for a hair. It says that God demands equal justice. And certainly some crimes deserve, at least in my sinful eyes, a little extra. That's revenge. That's unjust. I'm not disgusted by that sin. I'm not disgusted nearly as much about gossip as I used to be. There are times I hear about things, people gossiping about me, that I did this and I did that, and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. I, I, I've heard it from even church members uh, out in the public, and I have to say that I'm not disgusted by it anymore, mainly because I get used to it. If somebody lies to me, I'm no longer... This doesn't bother me as much. Somebody cheats or somebody curses. <coughs> I have people all the time that when they're talking, they get all heated, and next thing you know, they start dropping the, the F-bombs or, or this right there, and then they look at me and they say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, as if I'm their judge. And it doesn't disgust me. But it disgusts God, doesn't it? We, I, I said that there are certain things that... I, I believe God can do anything, of course, unless it contradicts His nature. One of the things that contradicts His nature is the ability to look at sin. It's... Excuse my phraseology here, but I want to be perfectly clear. It is you, as sinful human beings, that can look at insignificant sins if they are nothing more than passing gas. But God can no more look at those sins that you call insignificant than you could look at a doctor playing with an aborted fetus right after he removed it from the womb. that we would be so mature in our Christ-like walk to be disgusted about sins as he is disgusted about sins. And I'm not talking about sins of another person. I'm talking about our own personal sins. And I would add that I believe that it is the, the mark of a mature Christian, of the mark of somebody who is, who is growing in Christ, who every single day becomes more disgusted by their own sins to the point that they wish the very same thing that God wished upon Christ. 
It says about Jesus, it says, God, and it's behind me, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Never miss this, that the full wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus because our sins hung from the trees. And every lashing he took, every thud in the head that he took, every nail that he accepted in his wrist was an illustration of how much God hates sin. That we may grow to be as mature as this. To desire the death of our own sins. Why so much? I also believe that the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus because our sins hung from that tree and God demands justice. I believe that we could all probably come to a consensus that certain people deserve to be punished. Westboro Baptist, do you know who they are? Protesters outside of, outside of the graveyards. As soldiers are being drove past, they're, they're, they're lynching mom. They have signs that says, God hates your tears. God killed your son. God hates, hates, hates. Does that not disgust you? I bet we could all probably come up here and have a vote. And we'd all come to a consensus that these people... You need to at least pay in some way, some retribution to the families that they have hurt. I would imagine that we could all come together and we could all agree that certain people that have existed need to suffer for all of eternity in hell. Hitler. And we all agree that certain criminals need to pay with their life. The Bible says that God hears our cries and the answer to our demand for justice <coughs> is either one of two things. It is either hell or it is the torture, the beating, the crucifixion, the suffocation that he suffered on the cross of Jesus Christ. I was witnessing to one woman and I explained that to her. I said that's, that, that it is an either or. Either it is hell or either it is Jesus who dies. Those are the only thing. Either we pay for our sins for all of eternity or Jesus pays for our sins. It's either or. And she was out of her mind angry. She said, how, how dare you? Why does it have to be either one? Why does it have to be either one? My God is a loving God. My God loves us so much that he just forgives our sins. That Jesus doesn't have to die for our sins, and we don't have to go to hell. What kind of horrible person are you? I told her, if your God is the God of the Bible, then indeed, your God sends people to hell. In fact, it was Jesus who spoke more about hell than any other, any other teacher in the Word of God. You want to talk about a contradiction? In nature. My question is how in the world do you think that it is a loving response not to punish people? I asked this person, I said, you know what, I've got, I've got a real problem here and I want you to help me out real quick. I am constantly counseling people. We go back to this, 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 this situation of, of, of women uh, uh, who have been abused in such a way. And there's all types of things that, that, that I'm ministering to. That people who have been hurt in big and bad ways. I said, please give me what I can tell them. I said, after you've been victimized in such a way, 
How is it unloving to tell them that God hears their cries and he will make sure that that person who has committed such a horrific crime against you will not be punished? How is that loving? What kind of beast exists that cares very little about the suffering that we've gone through? And every single one of us in this room have gone through some sort of suffering by the hands of people who just don't care. And God loves you so much that he'll make them pay for their sins. Or he loves you so much that he will make sure justice is done. And he does it through Jesus Christ on the cross. The Bible says God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. But I ask you this. Have you not heard another? Have you not lashed out in anger at one of God's children? Have you not lusted after one of his daughters? And maybe even defiled her? Have you not stolen? Have you not stolen this week, maybe from your employer? Do you not lie? Are you any better than the people who hurt you? Should God not listen to their cries as well? He hears their cry as well, too. Have you not tried to hurt God's precious sons and daughters with your words, with your hands, in your heart, but not by neglect and even in God's name? <clears throat> the vicious slaughter of the lamb is God's answer. Oh, that we would demand this type of justice ourselves instead of revenge. Oh, that we would seek the justice that Jesus Christ demanded, that he preordained, that every single time we are hurt, we cry out, Lord God, pay for their sins. Every single time somebody says something bad, please, Jesus, take another blow. But that was God's perfect justice. And the cross not only, did, not only shows his disdain for sin, but it also shows his demand for justice. And what about when you lash out at God? We were in Arlington Cemetery this a couple of weeks ago, and, and I don't know if you've ever been. It was probably one of my favorite places in all of Washington, D.C., and we're walking there, and there are just stone after stone after stone of our dead heroes. There is monument after monument. There are names. You couldn't possibly read them all. And there were these young kids who were walking down, and they were having a, just a blast. They were screaming and yelling and cussing, littering, walking on the graves of our dead soldiers. The people were lit. Disrespect. Every sin committed against God is a slap in his face. Lord, you say yes, I say no. Shut up. Lord, you say no, I say yes. Do you believe those youth need to be disciplined for their disrespect of our heroes? How much more do we deserve to be disciplined for our disrespect of the holy God? You see, the dead can't even hear. There are three, four feet of dirt that separates their body 
from the outside world. And even if they could hear through that, I assure you, through their, through their ears, which have decayed long since, long ago, they hear nothing. The cross is God's answer to the disrespect that we have shown towards Him. There's a scene in Full Metal Jacket where Private Pyle gets caught with a jelly donut. <coughs> and the drill instructor makes him stand on his foot locker and eat the jelly donut as he punishes the platoon. I believe the quote was, they're paying for it, you eat it. And he ate it. Every lash, every strike, every moment that he suffocated on the cross was in pain for your sins. Romans 3.25 says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. <coughs> Why so much? The cross is the answer for God's demand for justice. It is a demonstration of his disdain of sin. But even more than that, the severity in which he was tortured, the endurance that the cross demanded, is a visible demonstration of his love for us. There was an earthquake recently in New Zealand. Did you read about this? It brought down the Christ church. Many people were inside worshiping as the building tumbled down. The land was shook and the building couldn't stand up and it started crumbling in. There were people inside that were trapped for days. There were people that were trapped underneath that rubble. And of course, there were many people who died. But there was this young one woman and she is unnamed to this day. She was walking. They know who she is. They just haven't re re released her name. She, she was just got done shopping. She was walking down the streets, pushing her baby. When the earthquake hit, when the Christ <clears throat> began to crumble, brick by brick, stone by stone, shattered glass started falling from the building, raining down upon her and the baby. Witnesses say that this young mother covered her baby with her body. And as bricks dropped 30, 40, 50 feet in the air, smashing her in her back, blows to her head, she would not move. Immediately after the earthquake, the rescuers ran up as fast as they could, and they began to remove the debris. And there, Under her lifeless and dead arm, they found a screaming baby. The full wrath of God is coming upon you because of your sin that he finds so disgusting he can't even look at it. And if you think that for a moment you can possibly escape, then I encourage you to read about such cases of Sodom and Gomorrah, the days of Noah, the Exodus. When God's wrath comes upon us, there is not a single person who will be willing to escape unless God intervenes. <coughs> Jesus Christ loves you so much <clears throat> that he literally wraps you in his arms so that you can't even see the destroyer coming. And with each blow, he protects you.
He absorbs your blow. The lashes upon his body, the slashes on his back, all meant for you he accepts. Because he loves you so much. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why not a drop? Because a drop does not illustrate his disdain for sin. A drop does not represent the demand that he has for justice. And there is nothing like that most disgusting scene that we all just watch. Again, an artist's interpretation of it that demonstrates the type of love that he has for us. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> for God so loved the whole world God loved John LaFont, Robin Smith, Isabel Jenkins, Barbara Brown, the Bounds. Whoever believes in him, whoever runs to his open arms and crawls upon his lap and buries their face in his chest as the blows come down, will have everlasting life. Because it would be unjust to punish us twice for our sins. He received our blood. Father God, my prayer today is that we would all grow to hate sin as much as you, that we would all grow to demand the type of justice that you thought best, and that is your son dying on a cross for us and those that would hurt us. And Father God, that, that, we, would, that we would express the love that you showed to us for each other and for this world. It says that we love because you first loved us and you demonstrated that love by dying on us. That we would show that type of love. <clears throat> Father, it's, it's a prayer today. And not just today, not just during this season, but every day that we are reminded about how much you love us. You died for us. It's in the precious blood I can even pray. Amen. <clears throat>